how's your energy? It's good, right? Nice and sunny. We have plenty of time. Ladies, please take a seat. And we are going to talk about the global game in the sense of, and it, it does make sense, as Laura said, we're, we're in Europe, so why not? Um, uh, football, soccer, as we know it. I, I was fortunate enough to do a panel yesterday with Ashlyn Harris, who talked about um, being an Olympian and what it means to actually play soccer in the States. And she shared how difficult it can be um, for women in sports, but we all know that that's not something that we have never heard before. But it's beautiful to have all of you here today. And I wanted to talk about making, sh making sure that this was a shared experience in growing the game, the global game. Um, Alessia, I would like for you to introduce yourself to everyone, how long you've been playing, where you're at currently, and we'll take it from there, just so everyone has a full background. Yeah, hi, I'm Alessia. I play for Arsenal in England. Um, been playing ever since I can remember. and. Uh, yeah, hopefully got lots more years to come. Yeah. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Gemma, currently playing at Liverpool. Um, like Lassie, I've been playing ever since I could walk. Um, so yeah, I've won two WSL titles with Liverpool, um, two FA Cups with Manchester City, and hopefully a few more ye years left to play too for me. This is like when I pitch with Carly Telford, who's in the room, and I always ask to go first because I don't play football. Um, so I work in the business side at Chelsea, um, specifically on the women's team and building the business around super successful team on the pitch for the last decade. I think that's amazing. And we obviously, can I, can I start with Zara first? Because you say, you say the people don't care. The business of the sport is why we're here. We're trying to grow it. I think that when we were talking about what we wanted to see for the global game, you talked about investment in the sport. What does that look like uh, for soccer, for women's soccer, specifically football? I think there's a real opportunity to make sure it's player first. So making sure that there's been a lot of discussion around as the game grows, actually making sure player welfare is at the heart of everything that you do, which Alessia and Gemma will be able to talk about a lot more. Um, but also making sure that the give back goes to the players. And I think the WNBA are kind of leading the way a little bit with that at the moment as to how they're building out um, you know, player welfare from flights to um, sort of central contracts, etc. So I, I think it's just making sure that we recognise sort of the, the players and their worth in the game, but also their value within it as well. Yeah, the value, the investment, the value, and the players rarely see it. The players, and you talk about the WNBA, have started to really make sure that they've, t they've taken it in their own hands. Uh, Brianna Stewart has decided that she and Aficia Collier will start, the, Collier will start their own league um, because they see that they want to have the change and it's a little too slow. Gemma, you and I were talking a moment ago about making sure that it starts at an early age. Talk to me about what you'd like to see change in football. Yeah, I think for me, I think we've for so long wanted young girls to encourage them to get playing sport, um, not just necessarily football in general. I think we've probably seen a huge influx and increase in participation levels. And I think now we've got so many young girls that are doing any sport, you see them, not necessarily just football. And now I think we've progressed. Um, I think we've overcome probably the participation barrier, but now it's for me, can we give the six-year-old girl the same access, the same coaching? the same education um, as the, a six-year-old boy gets. And I think if we can educate, and obviously we go back to putting the, putting the time, putting the money back into the players, if we can start that at a young age group. Um, the How young, would continue. you say? I mean, for me, I'm saying if, if you're a young footballer at a football club, you should be getting equal at a seven-year-old girl, seven-year-old boy. It shouldn't matter what age you're at. It should be facilities. That gives you the access. I think... The willingness there is from the girls now to go and play, and it's now helping them, nurturing them um, to be however good they want to be. And I think you now can get a, a 16 year old girl. I think we're seeing it now in the game that if you're good enough, you're old enough, right? And I think the, the youth progression in the women's game can progress so much. And I think that will really develop the women's game, especially in the future. And I think just to build on Gemma's point, it's about investing in, in our players as athletes, 
and not as charities anymore. I think for a long time, women's football, women's sport was always the kind of charity diversity bit that got put into a partnership. Mm -hmm. And now actually, you know, they're standalone performance athletes in their own right. And it's recognizing that and making sure the value associated to that is I, right. I appreciated that you said that. And that's, and that's universal, right? Uh, for so long, women's sports have been treated like, well, we have to do it. You know, it's a, okay, we have to have it there. And I think now we're seeing the value and they know the value and everybody is on board. And and it's, it's really spectacular. Gemma, you talked about how they're now having training facilities as well as places for them to study, so it makes it easier. Uh, are you guys familiar with Olivia Moultrie? Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, right? Olivia Moultrie is a really good example. Yeah, <laughs> Portland, yes. A really good example of someone who believes, or her father believed that she could play at any age and started very young and pushed so that she could be in the league. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, for me, being at Liverpool, I think we're extremely lucky. We have one of the best facilities, in my opinion, in the world in women's football now. Um, and I think alongside that, it's allowed us to have our academy in-house with us training. And, you know, I think education is also important for young players. And now that for us at Liverpool, they can see a pathway, they can come, they can study, they can work, but also it allows them facilitating to be, you know, have the ambition to be a professional footballer. And, you know, we have them on site and if we need them to join in first team training, it's, it's not a problem. It's actually a part of their life now. And I think for having people, having young girls to see that now and have the ambition to, OK, I don't just have to choose education or football, which... I think for a long time it probably was in terms of, you know, I know Les, you went to America because it facilitated you to do that. I think having that in England now, we have the quality of players, we have the facilities. And yeah, I think at Liverpool, we've definitely got an amazing facility um, and it's allowing the, the youth and the progression. And, you know, I'm sure I'll have probably young players coming through wanting to take my shirt off me. But <laughs> for me, I, I'd love to see that and I'd love to see the game keep growing. I love it. Let's see what's been your experience. Yeah, for sure. Like Gemma said, when I was a young girl, it, it was always a route in through boys football. And now the game's grown and there's an access to most girls' team and we're still trying to make that even better. So there's no girl that is left unable to be involved in women's football. Um, whether that's a coach, a referee, a player, whatever they may want to be. But yeah, I went out to America because it was the right thing to do for me at that time. I wanted to study and I wanted to play and there wasn't an opportunity to do that in England. Um, but now, yeah, like Gemma said, with Melwood and all these clubs back in their, their youth and making it better for the younger girls, that's exactly what we want. Sarah, why do you think it's, it's now known that it should be more of an investment in the athlete, not necessarily a charity? Um, I don't think there's one answer to that. I mean, I've, to give a, a Cannes example, so five years ago when I came to Cannes for the first time, mm. the Women's World Cup was also on in France. And uh, if you looked at a lot of the content and scheduling around that Cannes, there was sort of the odd panel here and there. And, you know, we joked about sort of any female sports executive got put into a panel because it's like, oh, thank God there's a woman that we can put onto that panel. Oh. And the, um, there was a group that said, actually, let's take a box out at the game down in Nice. And it was England, Japan. And Carly, who sat here, was actually in that squad. Um, and you ended up, you know, there was a real having to persuade people to leave Cannes and go to that game that night. Mm -hmm. And now five years on, and I see there's a women's sports house. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sports beach. I think it's in general, there's sort of Cannes, if, if it's a good indication has recognized the business and advertising opportunities in sport in general and I think women's sport in particular has opened up because it's just more accessible you know I, I think in the women's game in the UK you see it fans whether they're male female young old like the women's game because it's more accessible the players are more authentic they're willing to speak up and actually have a purpose and people are willing willing to put a value onto stuff so you know the sports bra is a really good example of you know the bar in the US when everyone went you're mad like putting just women's content on and actually turned over, a, is it a million dollars in the, in the first year? And actually now it's a place that everyone wants to go. And actually in the UK, everyone's saying, how do we replicate that in the UK? So it's sort of, you, you need a couple of trailblazers, yes. whether it's from players, whether it's from people showing content that lead the way and then everyone follows afterwards. You said a couple of things that I think are very interesting and it was just very matter of fact. The women are more authentic, they have a purpose, um, they want, and they're more accessible. You don't find, and you don't find that with the male players. And is that what makes it special to you in terms of not even just investing, but monetizing as well? 
I, I mean, I don't, I don't. I think it's probably a sweeping generalization for me to make that none of the male athletes are like yeah, that. I was like, <laughs> most some of them. <laughs> I think it's more the context of what they're in as well. It's harder for them to have a voice because oh, you know you okay. you speak up and you're taken down quite quickly, particularly in English media. Oh. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for us. You know, I sort of say that the WSL in particular is at this great point in time where if you could take all the lessons from the last 30 years of the Premier League and rewrite football now, what would you do? And I think that's where the WSL is. Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to reflect the best of society. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, you use the Lionesses two years ago, win the Euros, and then actually go and lobby for change in the government in terms of school access and football. And it's sort of the two things just seem to naturally go more hand in hand. Yeah, I think I'd probably just add to that in... I never started playing football or playing sports because I thought I could be a professional in it. It just wasn't a career for me. And I think it's probably the same for pretty much every every female in sport that you're always told that, you know, chances are limited or there might not actually be an opportunity for you, for you to go and play. And I think mm. no one has probably never, ever done it for money. They've done it because they love the sport, they love the game. And I think it's been so powerful for me, definitely being here, um, being around such strong women and they're leading in their own right. And I think when you come together, it can be so powerful. Um, but I think that's probably the, the genuine route um, and people do it for the love and they have a genuine care to actually grow and leave it. You know, I was that young girl once and if that young girl can have a better experience than I did when I was younger and more opportunity, then I think that's why we all do it. Do you want to add to that? Well, I mean, Gemma said it so well, but yeah. no, I agree. I think that, yeah, we do it because there's so many times where we've been told we can't do it. And we all, 90% of the people that, well, maybe 100% except for the young ones coming through now, although people might say I'm still young, but I don't feel it, <laughs> um, have all gone in through boys football. Everyone you speak to started at a boys team, played with the boys. And although I think that was great and I think it taught me a lot and I, I actually really enjoyed it and like to kind of prove them wrong, but that can often make a girl m maybe not want to play football. It's not people like them involved in the sport. It kind of feels a bit different. And for a girl in a boys' team, that might stop them and shy them away from the sport. And, yeah, I think the fact that we can have more and more girls, investment, things like this coming into the game now, yeah. you're going to maybe not miss the next superstar coming through in case they were they were afraid to play with the boys. Yeah. And I just think on Alessia's point, I think she's hit the nail on the head of that's where you kind of see the growth on the business side because... I would, I'd guess that most women in this room at some point have felt the same sentiment in their world of that's not for me or actually I can't see it, therefore I can't be it. And that's where I think women's sports having its growth, that actually it's become a symbol for how a lot of other women feel in their industries and vectors. I talked with Gemma and she said that she's played for a few teams and that was because in the beginning, in the beginning, the contracts are like for one year. We're very familiar with what the women make here in the States. Talk to me about your contracts and how you're saying now you guys are actually signing longer deals. Yeah, I think... Bigger contracts. Yeah, that probably <clears throat> makes me sound like I move around a lot. <laughs> uh, just honestly, a, just I'm one a or two person. places. She's very loyal, yes. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, we were discussing before how I think with the women's game being so young and when the league first came in, it was semi-professional. So, you know, obviously you're, I was studying at the time and contracts, you know, you, you have to try and earn a living and, and you want to do that as your job. But I don't think necessarily the sustainability in the league, um, not just necessarily in clubs. And you weren't maybe sure that from one year to the next, you could guarantee that your club would fund the contract. So I think a lot of players were... I mean, it was very rare for a player to probably sign a two-year contract at the time. Um, you would usually go year by year because you were almost afraid to commit because you, you knew the reality of the women's game was that funding could be pulled at any point. Um, and I think now we're seeing players sign four, five-year contracts, and I think that shows a huge progression in the game. Um, but I would also say there's still probably a long way to go because you look at when Reading got relegated from the top league um, two seasons ago, they dropped to the league below and they turned part-time. Um, so I think the reality is that it's still happening. It's still live in the women's game, but yes, for sure, we've made huge strides um, and it definitely gives more, more confidence, more stability for players and you can go and actually know that, okay, I have a bit of a settled life in terms of my career and 
I feel confident knowing that I can go and sign a two, three year contract, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Alessia, how would you like to see the game grow globally? Um, I mean, I think it's tough because I'm still quite new in the world of football and like, yeah, I mean, since I've been playing, I've noticed the biggest difference since we won the Euros and we touched on it earlier. I think it shouldn't have had to have taken winning a trophy, but it did for the Lionesses and, and the women's football and the game and the league and things like that. I think what one thing that I love, I love playing, walking out in a stadium and seeing it full. And I don't think you ever have to question whether mm -hmm. women's teams can sell out stadiums anymore. And I think that's really cool. Um, We've just announced that we're playing 11 games next season at the Emirates, um, which is massive wow. for, yeah. for the club. And That's huge. we sold them out quite regularly last season. And yeah, as a player, that's what you dream about. You dream about walking out in the stadiums and it being packed and the crowds with you. And I think that momentum follows through in the club and things like that. And yeah, as a player, that's, that's what you want each week to be walking out and sharing those moments with them. Yeah. Zara, same question for you. What would you, as we get ready to wrap, what would you like to see in oh, terms of? I was growth? thinking when you asked Alessia, I'm like, glad you didn't ask me that. That's okay. a big, <laughs> big question. Um, I, I think it's just how it can grow, also with men's football. So if you, you know, if you look at Stamford Bridge and Chelsea, it's not in spite of, it's as well as. So there's, you know, a couple of stats that 40 percent or 30 percent of new women's football fans are new to football. Period. So that should be a great growth opportunity for every league and governing body around the world. Um, and 40% of those in the UK will support more than one team. So they're not tribal. They, they tend to be Lioness fans, actually, and then come down and find a team. But if you sort of take the Emirates as an example, that's, what, 600,000 fans if you sell out, or plus, if you sell out those um, 11 games. Mm. And if it's a very similar data to ours, you know, only 5 or 6% of our attendees are actually men's season ticket holders. Mm. So you're talking about a huge proportion of new fans coming into Arsenal or Chelsea. Um, and I think that's, that's an exciting growth opportunity. And, and the other nice thing has been, and I'm fairly new to the world of football, I joined from Formula One, um, but I've only been here for a year. And the sort of the collaboration amongst all the teams and the clubs has been great. I mean, Arsenal have led the way in the UK with their selling out of stadiums, but they've worked with all the other clubs to share information and sort of share best practices so that we can all grow together. And I think, I don't know, like, I don't know if that's different to men's football. It's kind of the only world I know being in women's football where mm -hmm. everyone is working together. And I think if we can maintain those values, we'll grow in the right way. And Gemma, for you, you've had, now you've had some time. The both ladies answered it, you had some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think as a player, like Les said, you want to be walking out in front of genuine fans. Um, I think I've also played in front of stadiums where there's not really an atmosphere, but tickets have maybe been given away. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have that same vibe because people are there because, you know, the kids brought home a free ticket from school and the kid wanted to go. But I think now it's a genuine interest and a genuine care and actual genuine support of people wanting to buy shirts, wanting to come to games, wanting to buy the tickets for games before you even know who the team is going to be playing against. Um, and probably a genuine affiliation with the women's team. And I think that's probably what you get, like we spoke before, with the authenticity of the women's game and the women's players. Um, I think I would love for it to grow on all levels. And obviously we've mentioned grassroots, but um, I think it also starts with the mindset and the changing and... Um, making it more accessible. We've obviously seen it's a lot more on TV, showcase worldwide. There's games on YouTube now. Um, and I think once people see it, then they get on board. Um, yeah, that's it. And for me, I think that's probably been the huge difference. You know, I've got people saying, oh, I saw your game on Sky. I mean, five years ago, it was one game every two years on Sky. Wow. And I think now that obviously Sky is a huge thing for men's football, why shouldn't women's football be on there too? So... If people can see it, they get on board, and that's what helps people attract and, and come and support us actually at games and, and have that real experience. Yeah, the common thread that I've, and I did the panel yesterday, it's always been there. The quality has always been there in women's sports. It's just the opportunity to showcase it, and right now we're able to showcase it. You said just a few moments ago, which I think is interesting, three years ago, a women's sports house didn't exist. Five years ago, this wasn't even a concept. And so now here we are talking about how we can grow this game globally. And you're talking about how you have a game once in a while. You know what I mean? On Sky Television. Now you can catch it and people can see and believe and we're watching that happen 
globally. So I want to thank you all for helping grow women's sports globally. Um, and we really appreciate you being here. Can you give it up for Alyssa, Gemma, and Zara?